He stopped burning. He didn't leave a voicemail. His number popped up, but he, he never leaves a message. Yeah. Yeah. I saw his number when I got back to my office this morning. I didn't get a chance to call him back, but he doesn't leave any message. Yeah, you don't leave a message. It's not important to me. Okay, so. Did you enjoy the game? Yeah. that we have that we've honored this weekend and some folks continue today to honor lord we just we just thank you for each and every one and for the sacrifices them and their families have made we ask you to be with us as we go through the town town agenda and be with us as we go about our week to to make things happen for our town we send your precious and holy name i pray amen, amen. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Yes, I need approval of the agenda. Motion to approve the agenda. All in favor of motion? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Agenda review for council regular meeting. Turn the paper to you, Mr. Thomas. I was looking, I thought we were going to do some of the discussion first before we did that. That's okay. You can change it if you want to. You want to change the agenda? Order the agenda? Yeah, I think so. The, uh, I would. Uh, you yeah. need a motion to change it at this point since you've already approved it. Okay. What do you want to do? I, I want to go ahead and do the discussion topics right. uh, first and then do the agenda review. <clears throat> I'm sorry. So I, 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 uh, I just didn't agenda. notice the change. Uh, modify the agenda to uh, move all the items, <clears throat> the topic items, uh, ahead of the uh, agenda review for council labor meeting, making them five. Uh, Discussion topics five and it's numbered appropriately. Second. Okay, all in favor of motion? Aye. Aye. Motion carried. Thank y'all. Okay, so we'll start with the feasibility of establishing a helipad in Leland, presented by Bob Pimwell, Transportation Oversight Committee and Planning Board member. I'm, I'm going to come out to the podium if that's okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm very shy and not used to public speaking. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I, I think I actually know just about everybody here, but I'm Bob Penwell. I'm on the uh, planning board for, for the town, and uh, I'm a newbie on the uh, transportation oversight, which is why uh, you probably as guests, that's why I got selected to do this. <laughs> now, uh, it came up in our, in our first meeting, uh, we had kind of a Q&A, think out of the box kind of thing. And I made the recommendation that we give some serious thought to establish a helipad in the town of Leland. Uh, and that's, that's what I'm gonna to present to you today. And let, let me start off by saying there are no firm answers to, to what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm, 
Are you the note taker, Sabrina? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Life easier. Thanks very much. Uh, so, the, the point of it is, with the current, and, and my point here is that with the current projected growth in Leyland, look where we've been in the last 15 years and where we're projected to go, uh, that I, I think the time is now to start thinking well out of the box <clears throat> and well forward. And so, with that, uh, my idea or concept is that we should now take the steps to study and decide about the feasibility of a health uh, Okay, So let me, let me get to what, what I can on the outline, and, and this is just an outline for, for your discussion, and then, and then propose it to, to the council. But here, here's my point. Who would use a helipad? Well, first of all, look at the growth of medical. Uh, we have New Hanover Medical Group in Brunswick Forest. We have Wilmington Health now outside Magnolia Greens. We have Emer Ortho building at 55,000 square foot, large facility down there. We have you know, Hanover Hospital. We have Brunswick Hospital. The number of, of air evacuations going to Duke and to Raleigh Durham now is increasing every year. More and more people are using uh, you know, HELVAC uh, for medical purposes. And more and more people are now actually carrying out the insurances to do that. The reason I did them before was because it was exorbitantly expensive. But as we go forward, that's good. those numbers are going to start coming down. And in my opinion, uh, I, I think that's I think that's going to increase. I, I probably should preface by the fact that in my first life, uh, I was I was a uh, army officer. In my special I was in army aviation. Uh, I flew with helicopters for 18 years. Uh, was a also an aircraft maintenance officer and a test pilot for the CH-47 Chinooks, the big, the big ones, and uh, all the smaller ones as well. So if I get a little excited when I talk about this, you'll, you'll know, and if I jump up and down, it's because that's what I'm used to doing, that, okay? So, uh, so just the medical alone is up to five or six users. And, and don't think what's just on this side of the river. Think about the evacuation that comes from other places, because that's the advantage of, 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 of helicopter transportation. Uh, the military, lo and behold, the Coast Guard has a helicopter, and it, they use that to go offshore, and guess where it's currently staged? Elizabethtown. It's not on the coast. You do not want to forward stage rotor wing helipads at the point of use. That's just wasted blade and flight time. You put them out at the point where they can easily get back to where you're going, so that's just the hospital, and from there, stay on the aircraft you're using, and that's how you plan health mobility and strategic planning for rotor wing assets. So, to answer your question, you know, why would the, would the host car guard be in, in Elizabethtown? Because from there, they have flight access, a big stager also, because they have fuel, etc., etc. Now, let me be clear from, from the start. I'm not talking here, at this point, about any kind of an airport. I'm talking about a Concrete, we can, the studies, I've got all kinds of studies to show, but about a helipad, unmanned, lighted, with road access, not, not to be manned by any kind of tower. Uh, typically, uh, they're, they're, that control will take care of its place, and I'll, and I'll get to that. So uh, there's five possible military uses. Law enforcement. We have the Brunswick County Sheriff. They have, they have their assets. We have Sable out of Wellington, Wilmington. They move from place to place to place with the needing guns. We have state highway patrols. They use more and more, are using the uh, helipad or heli helicopter budget. We have Leland and other local police that occasionally have time, time, late time that they can get for needs. And, and I think in the future we'll probably be getting more of that. Civil users, possible airport to and from transport. Now this is, this is down the road a ways. Right now, not many people would get a helicopter to go to, down to Myrtle Beach or to Raleigh-Durham, but they might if it was available and the price become proper. Uh, you have WWAY-TV. They occasionally use rotor wing. You have other industrial opportunities. And, and in my opinion, to have that asset available would be a big asset for this town to sell our location for industry. Uh, I, I think from what I've we have, it's hard to get over, is that to get to the port, you have to cross the bridge. 
to get into to I I forty and the other places. It's just one more option we can offer. Is that we can, we can have you can have roadway transport here if need be. Now you're talking about that opens up to chemical companies, pharmaceuticals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They do a lot of distribution that way, uh, and, and it gives us uh, you know just another opportunity to have. So we have we have those. We also have electrical power providers, and as you all know, that's the way they check all the lines anymore. The, the old linemen are no longer walking them down the weeds. You, you see the helicopter flying low, uh, and he's tra he transmitting back to a local station. And that's the way all the power lines not only check but maintain these days. So those those are a list of, of what I would see would be the possible users. Uh, obviously, the reason we want to identify the potential users is it would be at least my attempt to talk to those users and perhaps see if they would be willing to also invest in such a property. So what are, what are we talking about? That I'm talking about a lighted, again, but uncontrolled concrete helipad. Kind of considerations we need to look at, and there are, there are many there are many legal and FAA approved options available. Uh, but typically, for an unmanned one, it's typically concrete, so you don't have to worry about uh, foreign object damage and so on. Lighted, uh, and those are all approved lights. It's just a matter of purchasing and installing them. Um, uh, we, we do need we do need road and emergency vehicle access, so we have to give that some consideration. We have to we, we have to get the FAA approval, and we also have to note that we are we are also in ILM controlled airspace for landing over there. But that's not a problem. I believe it happens to be in the downwind lake for for the uh, for the west landing field. But the, the altitude of the aircraft come in on that downwind base final, so they don't really drop altitude until they hit base to final. And and I don't think we'd have any problem there at all. Uh, if you around four o'clock in the afternoon, every afternoon you can see the helicopter coming right over Magnolia Greens where we live, and it's going to the hospital, and then later on going back to back back to the lift down get the white dog. So there's no problem with controlled airspace. It's just, it just just has to be known and published, and, and clearly it would be. The location of where would we put such a helipad? Well, we have several things we'd have to consider. Number one, among other things, what, what are the prevailing winds here? And that's just a matter of getting up the meteorological data, because that, that would have some control. Do we have road access? Do we need to, we need to get vehicles in to drop off points and have to be at least a reasonable road? Uh, I would think that would be you know practical for not only police law enforcement. Uh, ambulance, ambulatory, etc. Uh, and bear in mind, and yes, I'm fully aware that if we do that, we're, probably, we're going to be have to maintain that road as well. So there are other things. We have to worry about towers, power lines. Uh, Mayor Bozeman mentioned, for example, the, the lot back over there, not far from your office and so on. And, and that would be good, as long as you're not coming across WWAY's tower. That could be a problem, particularly if it's lighted. But we do have to look at all those things and make sure and we have power lines such as out here, and uh, they're okay as long as they're a sufficient distance away. And it's even better if they're not in the prevailing takeoff and departure winds. And those will prevail. Would also be a wind sock, you, you know, but typically it's a 30 knot wind sock, uh, so that the pilots can see that for themselves. Again, it's uncontrolled, we have no responsibility for it. Cost, uh, the, always, always the big hurdle, right, uh, is cost. Property, uh, will we have, do we have it? Can we use it? Do we have to purchase it, lease it, what? Construction, cost. Uh, it's a pretty good size pad and there are various units. But what I'm picturing is what they call an H pad, uh, which is a large concrete pad. It has a big H on it, which you can see how a pad. And the H gives you the, gives you the normal takeoff landing or preferred takeoff landing size one way or, or, the, or the other way, as, as opposed to a swastika and some of the other helipad markings, which means everybody on themselves. So construction, we have lighting to get there. We would need possibly, we would need security. I don't think so, but it would depend where it would be. Uh, and, and I don't think it would be anything more from, from my point of view, than perhaps maybe asking our, our police department to Casey drive by, has to become a good, you know, barbecue point. Somebody's not done the tricer, et cetera. And then, of course, there would be some upkeep. The surrounding area would probably need to be occasionally mowed, trimmed, or whatever. It depends where we are. So whatever upkeep would need to be necessary. I would hope that the shared cost of the users, uh, that we could come up with a shared cost, uh, along with the town of Leland, and then perhaps with other law enforcement agencies, county, perhaps even Sable and, and New Hanover would find it useful. 
Uh, that will all help me work out. And of course, as is typically the case with something like this, along with the medical units, they, they, initially they will kick back. And, and then we, so we're going to have to be convincing. And of course, the key is to get that first one to sign up. Two, three, and four, uh, something like this, sign up quickly after somebody makes the first move. So uh, basically, that's, that's the thought that I have and, and the vision that, that I have. Uh, I, I just personally think that it would be a real kudo for the town, frankly, that we, that we have at Active Telepath that can be used for industry and other types of things. Timing, it, the reason I bring it up now is because, and realizing this is not going to be a, a three month project, this is going to take some time. There's a lot of things to be done here. But I think we need to start now. My opinion is we need to start now to get ahead of other communities because I'm convinced. If we don't have an active health pad, what's to say Shiloh want? Or Bolivia? Or, or some of the other communities? And if they do, that knocks us off, that knocks us out of the ballgame. Because you don't need one 10 miles from another one. So so I, I think the timing is to, to start now. And what I am doing at this point is, is suggesting and recommending to the town council that a concept study providing will be initiated, provide some staffing expertise where applicable, and then an eventual decision on the town of either a town of Leland project or a Wilmington transportation oversight. That it comes into play too. But that is much larger, and, and you know, Pat Battle has been our, our, our workhorse on that for a long time, so she knows, uh, she's forgotten more than I know about it. But I know that it's a very large committee and organization, and nothing moves quickly in committees and organizations, large organizations. So, so I, I, I think we need to not predetermine which is best, whether it be the transportation oversight or the town. We need to get study and look at all these things and then, and then uh, take us, you know, take, let the decision go where the evidence leads us. So if there are any questions, I probably can't answer them, but I'd be happy to feel them. And uh, that basically is, is, is my presentation. What I'm really doing is, is kind of giving you a, a whiteboard list of things that need to be done. And I could throw out some what I would think some answers might be, but that's just my opinion, and that didn't count much. So, what I'm saying is, with the town council approval, we can then get to work. I'd be happy to to volunteer uh, for that. And uh, and uh, but at this point in time, I think to really get started up, we're going to need council's approval because clearly we're going to need some staff and expertise. You know, from a lot of people I see sitting right here. Questions? Paul. Yes. This ball. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, uh, you're, sit, you're sitting in the middle of four. So it, it, was, it was big in the 40s and 50s. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're sitting in the middle of four, and I want to say, where were you on Friday night at 10 o'clock? <laughs> uh, no, a couple of a couple things. Um, with, with, is part of your um, plan or your thought to have uh, along this pad a, a fuel supply? No, no. No fuel. Do not want to do that. Okay. Yeah, because that, have, there are that's a whole other <coughs> It's a whole other thing. Some of them use that, then, then, you're, then you're talking, are you going to do, have an area to pull off? Are you going to do hot refuel? You don't want to be hot refuel on the, on the health. That gets, that gets into a very different... And then there's EPA effect. regulations and all that. Too. Exactly right. Exactly right. Then you have fuel, then you have to have underground tanks. Now you've got to have a 12-foot fence. And so uh, I would say that we probably don't want to go that. Okay. that. On, your, um, on your construction, would this be a fence? Standard, uh, you know, chain, chain link fence mark on it. Uh, it's not a requirement to have, that, <coughs> but uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, Police Chief James can tell us that's probably a, probably a very low cost for what it would add, uh, because it's it's uh, you come out the land and just you can't believe the number of people somebody wants to come out and take a picture, you know, like, and and then and it's just not good. So I would say, yeah, and, and truly, as we all know. You know, high school beer party on a, on a concrete pad? Why not? You know, yeah. you know, we can dance with everything, right? So, yeah, we'd have to take some common sense security. You mentioned um, can you, do these? you mentioned ten mile radius. How does that? I'm sorry. You mentioned ten mile radius. You said some dog, you know, somebody else. Oh, oh no! So I, just, I just throw that a requirement if, for that. No, no, there's not. Okay. Uh, I'm just saying, if they're, uh, let, let's say below uh, Bolivia or somebody decided to do that, mm -hmm. or Shalot, uh, then that would certainly then just fit our need here. Mm -hmm. 
and, and part of what I'm looking here is, is futuristic, you know, to, to offer this to industry and, and perhaps industrial business coming in. And we can resolve the problem of uh, a lot of problems, frankly. You know, how far are we from how far are we from transporting whatever back and forth to Raleigh? Well, about 40 minutes. No problem. So things like, like that, but there's no there's no legislative or, or authority about the closeness of the yeah, the FAA gets a little concerned if they're too close. Sure. Because you're uncontrolled and they've got crisscross traffic. But right. They, they do, you do radio in. You radio into a you know, flight following. In this case, somebody come in, would call ILM and just announce landing, you know, below the zone. And they, just, it's just for the other pilots to listen to. But it's un, basically, it's uncontrolled. Would part of your uh, outreach to possible users? Um, would that include a, uh, a summary of perhaps how often they may use it or may not use it? Or yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I think it's part of the, the homework we have to do yet is is uh, you know do do, do some some you know cracking on the knuckles and trying to figure this out, right. and then run some initial meetings with some of the potential users, find out their point of interest, what their concerns are, what their possible needs are, and and then. When we find when we find the hot button or two, we, we follow it. I mean, we, we push that one first. Uh, and like I said, the, typically on something like this, in my experience, is getting the first one or two to sign up is, is the hard part. And after that, they start going, "Oh, what the heck?" You know. Uh, and basically, all the big thing for for I don't know really even at this point in time, know if there would be a need to have a financial charge for upkeep if we, if we could get contribution for the for the development, you know, and the installation and so on. I don't, don't think the upkeep would actually be that bad, that probably we would, we would have enough gain out of it. But that's not my decision. That's up to, up to y'all. What about liability? Like, sure. As long as, long as we're within the FAA specs, you know, space and specs, then I don't think we have any liabilities. It's uncontrolled. It's, it's published as an uncontrolled helipad. So that, that means you know, you're coming in at, uh, at your own combination. We would make sure that we do meet, you know, all the, all the requirements, clearances, and like I said, high lines, towers, and so on, and make sure those are clear. And if not, that, that uh, landing charts would be published that picks those things out. Would this be more of an item, uh, public safety item, like where the police and the EMS would be involved? Question for him or for us? I, I, for anybody. <laughs> Chief, what do you think? Well, I mean, we, I, I don't, we're part of the cycle system now. Uh, we pay with that every year. We very seldom uh, have to have to use it. Probably more of a, a fire EMS issue than than police. Of course, the sheriff's department has their own helicopter, so I mean that that would possibly be a potential user. Of it. But I would think it would be more of a fine or EMS issue than police. From, from our standpoint, it would go to where the pad would be at and where the emergency is at. So we have um, remote sites set up like fields, um, you know, various fields throughout the community, large opening, grassy areas, and stuff like that. So having one helipad is probably not going to work for us, except from the standpoint of like hurricanes and stuff like that, as far as um, commodity drops off and stuff like that. And I don't know that that's going to justify one based off of frequency of those storms. But um, from a evac like evacuating a, uh, an emergency patient out, we land them either on the highway or in a ball field, a nearby ball field, um, you know, stuff of that nature. So, and there's probably ten of those uh, in our fire district. That are already pre-set up, pre-done, and um, ready to roll. The uh, Vitalink or I mean, Airlink already has all the coordinates for that. So we just tell them we're going to be at landing zone five, and they look on their list and enter it into their GPS, and they're on the way. So our question was: to, do, you, do we feel that it needs to go? It should go to the public safety committee first. <coughs> Back here. No, that's not what I was asking. Oh, that's what I thought you said. No, I was just wondering in general. But I, but, uh, 
But then I still think about what he said about um, recruiting industry to the area. So that takes it to the economic development. <laughs> I operated out of an uncontrolled uh, health care with a senior military executive for three years. Uh, and I, I could definitely see some advantages, but I do believe there's fire suppression that may be required at the site uh, when it's active. So that's, that's, that's another that's consideration. True. To, that's to true. Have to, but there yeah, doesn't need to be a permanent installation, but there does have to be some brought the, the issue of law enforcement, depending on the <coughs> So forth, if there is somebody coming in and out, mm -hmm. so there's an additional, uh, you know, administrative requirement there, uh, physical requirement. Uh, there's an operations and maintenance requirement over a period of time uh, to keep it up to standard and so forth. And I think I think we included some of that. Uh, Homeland Security, ICE, uh, the military ocean terminal at uh, Sunny Point, um, and especially with the relationship we have with the, the railroad running through. Uh, through Leland, uh, those are all things that I think you could envision that, uh, that somebody might be interested in. So I think it's a good suggestion. Uh, I think there's a lot that goes into that. Um, honestly, I think a cost-benefit analysis would probably help to determine uh, the validity of it for us. Uh, I can see some advantages, obviously some advantages to us in many different ways. Mike, uh, being you've been in um, work with Bob and and just come up with that to see uh, the cost benefit and, and, and how to handle some of the things and just see if it's even possible as we go into the budget process. Okay. If I may also make a recommendation, I'm wondering if uh, WNPO could be of some assistance since they have you know the airport and FAA and all that. Uh, whether they can provide some study assistance, that kind of thing. Um, at any rate, I think it, it would be worth the time to talk to Mike Kozlowski about it, just to bounce it off, see what he thinks. Okay. Obviously, this is the first that we've ever talked about the hell of yeah. in the town. <clears throat> um, and Today, I don't know where we've had a, a need expressed for such a facility. Um, the, uh, we do have the airport nearby, and I think if you're going to study, you need to look at the existing locations of where a helicopter is available for people to, to use. Um, I think whenever Bob brought this up in the uh, Transportation Oversight Committee, it was looked at like uh, thinking of the future as the, the population of seniors that we have here that, and, and, and the possibility of a bridge problem or something to get the people where they need to get to real quick. I think that, that, that was some of the conversation that was in the transportation. <coughs> Transportation Oversight Committee that day, uh, and that's why we recommended Bob to, to just do some study and then come and talk to the whole council about it. But I think part of a feasibility study would be to address the actual need of the facility. Sure. Not just the the, the cost benefit associated. Mm -hmm. Would this be a 2045 plan? I mean, that's more timeline probably envision, envisioning. Yeah. I can tell you it's not been addressed in the 2045 I, I know. Plan. Yeah. But I'm wondering if they might I, want to have it. I think there's many medical facilities that are getting up. They've one on the project for us now. Uh, and I was talking to a developer yesterday who says he anticipates more, although he doesn't feel that we need a whole lot more, but he anticipates more medical facilities coming in. Um, I'm kind of like looking into the future. I mean, we don't, I, I wouldn't say we need one now, but uh, uh, for future uh, 
planning <coughs> in favor of doing a study, but I would also like to see um, the, the boards go back to economic development and to public safety and address it with them and give them a heads up of you know what what's going to be looked at. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe some of those questions need, like I said, you know, maybe you and Mike need to work with Bob and come up with some of these figures and some of these things to take to the committees. Uh, and Bob, I might add too, um, not too well published yet, but we have already, even curious about it, uh, approved and rezoned another large track in, in the Brunswick Forest for a uh, rebuilding, was it? it was three layers of, of assisted living. And it's going to have a large population to include ambulatory access. So that seemed to me to be another user. I, if they haven't they haven't uh, started digging any dirt yet, but but it, it's ready. And uh, that is uh, that's not by the way under that's according to state ordinance and law. It's not according to our local county. So, so we don't know exactly the progress on that. But it's yet another loser, user. Is my point. I'd be interested to hear what the members of the uh, Economic Development Committee think. Could we put it on the agenda? Well, maybe Bob could sure. give a presentation. Now I'm in favor of getting, a, getting that thought process at least rolling in that way, not wait till the facilities are all built and then one day find out, or oh, we really could have used the health ad here, mm -hmm. uh, some kind of evacuation system. Well, if I could, there, there actually is a 120 bed hospital here in, in Reland, or adjacent to Reland proper. So that's another medical facility that probably ought to at least, if you're listing medical facilities, add to it. Mm -hmm. Strategic uh, behavior. So. Yeah. And, and bear in mind, I don't, I don't have, these are all good questions. I don't have the answers for them. I don't even know if this is a, a you know, it's a good decision or not, but I think the time to it's time we need to get started and studied now because if if all went perfectly well, we're at the minimum probably talking, you know, five years. And truthfully, that's getting the budget, uh, and then Brenda's going to say uh, we're going to raise taxes or not. I'm go like, I don't know. <laughs> and uh, but, but hindsight is always is always good, as you know. But, but you, uh, my feeling is we need to start this ball rolling forward, and if it gets to be too hard, too expensive, or not needed, we just File it for it down the road. Well, that's fine if you get yeah. this two, two, these two guys and go over those things and, sure. and, and happy to. get it all together. Be happy to. Well, um, you know, you've got a funding pot, potential funding, I think, from uh, the uh, Fed's STPG system um, for uh, projects every year. And they don't have enough projects. So we don't want to lose the money that we've been getting from the federal government. So this might be an idea they might be interested in. Okay, letting us do. All right. Well, Bob okay. and Mike. Okay. Well, we'll I would I would uh, agree with Bob. We need to work with the committee. So this is not something that uh, that I would envision that. Uh, but you got to have everything to take to them. This. The three of us could sit down and, and come up with everything we need to do. I think we probably need to work, like you said, through each committee to get a recommendation from the Transportation yep. Oversight Committee, a recommendation from the Planning Board, and a recommendation from Economic Development. And I think we can maybe pick up some additional things that are involved. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I don't think we need to have a lot of information for the cost and users and all that kind of stuff. A lot. Right? Probably some, but you before have we, yes, before we before they go to the, it's taken to these committees um, and kind of get them in the loop, so to speak, is what what we're talking about. And then from there, you know, we can always then we can move on with more in depth uh, of what we need for information to make a good decision. Okay. Well, are you pretty good at it? Okay. Thank you, Bob. You're free to go. Okay. <laughs> Just don't leave town. <laughs> and next is uh, Brunswick County Public Utilities. Yeah, I uh, 
kick this forward to see if we think it's time to invite um, Ann Hardy and John uh, Nichols to come and give an update on what's happening with the uh, RO uh, system that they're working on to give us a, uh, an update on the grant that they are going for uh, to help uh, subsidize the construction of that. Um, just an update which the community hasn't had. See at PUA, they're always giving updates, good, bad, or indifferent. We don't ever really hear much from the county. So I'm just wondering if we should invite them to come and give a five, ten minute presentation of where we are with all of these things. And that should be a request from the mayor to the, the county board of commissioners chairman. Mm -hmm. uh, we then can direct the staff to from the bay chief. Is that what y'all want me to do? Fine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's good. Give me a hot word. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you make the big bucks. <laughs> okay, co sponsor drive with Bridge Presbyterian Church on February 7, 2019. Uh, yes, Mayor and Council, and uh, Bridge Presbyterian Church, uh, you would be so kind as to co host this event again. We usually have it here twice a year. Uh, so we're looking at February 7. So uh, I expect that your consensus there, that was uh, something that we still want to continue to do. I have no problem with it. Uh, we do it downstairs, right? That's correct. I think it's just good for the mm -hmm. community. Yeah. And they always seem to have a really good turnout. So that's good. Oh, thank you. Okay. And if, if you'll let Todd know that. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> Okay. Post Hurricane Florence, housing shelter. I was asking for an update on this item from the staff. Uh, so, what is it that you're looking for as far as? Well, what are, where do we stand with the 44 homeowners uh, from uh, Stony Creek? Do they have a place to live? Where are they staying? Are the FEMA going to come and provide shelter for them? What's going on with our folks that need, need a place to live? That's my question. I can answer a little bit. I know that um, the majority have gotten apartments. They're renting because uh, some of them does not want to rebuild, but they don't know what they can do yet and what they can't do. They don't know what they can or cannot do. So they've rented apartments. Uh, some of them said they're definitely not going to build back, so they've rented apartments. And um, um, there's some that has got, they got a real good deal on some campers from uh, uh, someplace in Calabash that offer to buy back the campers when they don't need them anymore. And um, it pretty much, and, and some of them are staying with family. Well, I think it would behoove us to get a better handle on this. We're starting to hear about this in the news. It was reported on Fort City this morning that people are asking for a buyout. I'd be interested to know who's asking for the buyout. You know, who's... Most of them. Okay, well, I, personally, I'd like to get beyond the generality of it, and why don't we look at the addresses so we have an idea of what those folks are doing and what their need is? I, I can update you on that, okay. Mr. Callahan. We, um, we're currently, what you're what you're talking about there is the hazard mitigation program. So there's two there's two kind of main pots of money that come down from FEMA in disasters like this. The first one's the public assistance. That's the pot of money that comes down from FEMA that we'll use for our debris removal and those types of things. And any damage to structures that we have. Now in the town, this kind of jumps down to your status of infrastructure and Leland question. Um, we really didn't have a lot of damage to buildings and structures. We can talk a little, well, I can talk a little bit about what we did have here in a moment. Um, but that is the that is kind of that pot of funding. The other pot of funding is this hazard mitigation uh, grant. So um, that is a federally uh, it's a program that comes down from FEMA 
and it's administered through North Carolina Emergency Management. So North Carolina Emergency Management works with the local jurisdictions to develop a plan for how to, how to address that. So we've had, Missy and I have had some conversations with folks with um, State Emergency Management. Um, we just last week got assigned our coordinator, our local coordinator for our area, and they're gonna have a, a meeting tomorrow in Lumberton for our region where we're gonna go and learn more about these programs and what these take um, to do these types of things. <coughs> in the meantime, we have been uh, put out with folks the folks in Stone Creek, the neighbors, there is a, an application that comes from North Carolina Emergency Management that just allows them to get some basic information about these folks, um, what their status is as far as the damage to their home, what the status is as far as their current uh, status of their um, insurance, whether they had insurance, whether they didn't have insurance, whether they uh, applied with FEMA uh, for assistance, what type of assistance that they may have received. It is a lot of that information gathering that you're talking about. We have a spreadsheet currently that, we, that we're working on that's got all the different folks that were affected by this, all their contact information, and then as we get those applications in, we'll start compiling those applications in a way that kind of the state recommends to kind of get a better idea of what this request is. The request of those people is largely buyout. So a buyout program within the town can, can take a number of different ways depending on what the different qualifications are. So it really is like they're still kind of, the state and FEMA kind of are still developing the rules and regulations for what this bio program might look like. So we don't have a defined, uh, a defined plan. It's a little bit frustrating for us because it's kind of one of these, it's almost like an unfettered mandate kind of thing. It's kind of like, okay, well, you're gonna administer this program locally here town. And then we say, oh, cool. well, how do we administer it? And they're like, oh, we're still working on that. You know, so it's a little bit frustrating. I see how people, and the community can get frustrated, but as to this point, we've done what our steps are that we need to do, and that is go ahead, have these discussions with the homeowners, start gathering their information, getting their applications. We're gonna learn more tomorrow, uh, more up there hopefully, and we'll be able by this by the end of this week to provide some more information to those homeowners to know what their future uh, their future uh, options may be for that. Now that being said, there's going to be a big decision for you guys as a board to come forward. Because these these hazard mitigation funds, somebody has to front the money for any kind of buyout that you're talking about. So if you look at if we were to buy out all of the properties just based on their market value right now, that's eleven million dollars. Obviously, we don't have eleven million dollars sitting there in the bank account just to buy these these folks out. And you know, turn you know that in a perfect world, that's what they would want. Um, the citizens the citizens that were affected would want. But that being said, there's going to be different kinds of criteria that are going to be developed as to who may be offered a buyout, who may not be offered a buyout, whether we're going to do buyouts at all. Uh, another question on this, because we have that high dollar value, is is this something that we work with the county on? Um, are they interested in doing this? And we've had some conversations with them. To the point, they're, to this point, they're not, they haven't committed um, fully to doing or not doing it. But they're kind of leaning towards probably not is, is, the, is the instance that we've got from them. So we still have to have some conversations there with the county, see what their intentions are. Um, we'll continue to pursue this. We'll bring that information back to you as we learn more about what this potential mitigation could be. That may be in your, your meeting next month. It may be in a special meeting at some point uh, where we can go this work because there are going to be some decisions that we're going to have to make. Um, so I guess that's kind of the update on the buyout that has been do we have any historical information on what other areas of the country have, cut, cut, cities have done under these circumstances? Yeah, I mean, it's not, it's, it happens all over the country. I mean, it happens all the time. And I think that, in, that's one of the things we're trying to learn more information about. I believe inland around, um, around the Lumberton area, they have done some more recent buyouts. So we'll look to see what they've done. Um, they did give us the name of somebody up in, Edenton or somewhere up in um, the northeastern part of North Carolina, that they, a county up there who has some recent experience within the last year of doing some buyouts. I'm sure you've seen that kind of the, one of the things that's been in the news is, well, all, they got all this money from Matthew, but that they haven't spent any of it or gotten any of that done. 
So really there hasn't been, to our knowledge, any real movement on buyouts from the Hurricane Matthew, but there was back in Florence. So um, we can kind of look at, and see what they did at that point in time um, to see kind of where, where we may stand in the world on buyouts. But it is not unprecedented. Well, the Port City Daily, uh, I think the headline said something like, Leland is, is backing the buyout, which sort of implies that we're, we got it. Well, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, it, it's kind of an unfortunate uh, way to do it, but I think what we are backing and from the previous you know, in, interest that this board has said is for us to explore that and to look into this and see what we can do and what our options will be. There, again, there will be a point where we bring this back to you guys and we have to make a decision on whether or not it's something that we want to do, but until we know the dollars and cents of it, that's not a commitment that you have. Yeah, this isn't an easy fix. And I, and I did arrange for Rouser to meet with them, and uh, he met with them, and he brought in some female representatives and that uh, was um, going to be working one-on-one -on -one with some of them. Um, the access to federal and state reimbursement, uh, is that covered under the Public Assistance Hazard Mitigation That's correct. Program? That's okay. Where do we stand with the big picture? Uh, so to date, uh, we're about 85 percent complete with debris pickup within the town of Leland. Uh, the contractors are estimating at this point in time that they should be done by the end of the month with all the debris pickup. Um, I met with them on site at the debris site here, just off of the Charging Diamond, uh, last not Friday, the Friday before that. 98,000 cubic yards of vegetated debris has run through that site as of that date. Uh, they've subsequently been picking up still, so um, quite a large volume of, of debris so far. Uh, so trying to get done before the holiday is, is their goal, but I'd say before the end of the month is probably more realistic. Are they continuing to make routes through the town and pick up what's out on the curb? Um, and how are we letting the citizens know what they need to do through the end of the month so they're working on their second pass um, we're updating our website and all our social media posts as we can uh, updating the FAQ sheets folks should still be doing the same things that they've been doing all along taking items to the curb categorizing them by the type of debris that that it is uh, and then as we get closer, if there's a necessity for a third pass, the contractor will make a third pass as needed. The, the, with the debris contractor at this stage, because they are in their second pass, they're sending out a monitoring vehicle. There's at least eight vehicles at a minimum that go out. They're actually physically driving every road within the town of Leland to ensure that there are, any, there are no addresses that have been missed or there are no items that have been, since been brought back out to the curb they're cataloging all those addresses, communicating that to the debris contractor, and then sending the vehicles out in that capacity, a little bit more efficient for a small car to go through than it is for the large truck. So that's a secondary measure they're doing to make sure nothing is missed. Mike, I just wanted to kind of clarify, you're talking vegetative debris. Uh, all debris. Whether it be so the vegetative, C and D, electronic, white goods. Okay. Uh, I've got a question too. Uh, someone posted on Nextdoor, when will our debris site reopen? Uh, so at this time, uh, we're estimating that December first would be when we would reopen our debris site, um, and then just kind of segue with that. We're estimating that we would also lift the burn ban by that point too and then again all the debris should be picked up and uh, we, we think that's just a good time for those two to coincide with one another. Thank you. Is it burn ban uh, just flat no burning or is it within 100 feet of the building? Can you clarify that? No burning at all. Okay. Uh, the question about status or the item status of uh, infrastructure in Leland uh, which I think uh, one of you, Neil, maybe you said something about that. Um, you know, I know that would include uh, the facilities that are owned by Leland, 
Um, and I would guess, at least my question about that has to do with um, stop signs, lighting poles, anything that was uh, you know, affected by, by the wind and the storm as to where we stand with all of that. Sure, I'd give an update on that. Uh, we just recently contracted with um, a gentleman who's going to do a, an inventory of, our, of all of our street signs um, for the post warrants damage. Um, gentleman who uh, has a company who does that so he'll be out riding the streets looking for where there's stop signs that are down where there are traffic signs that are down where those issues may be he'll inventory those provide those to us on um, like a shake file with the, he's going to go point it with um, so he'll have a mapping file so we can see where those issues are and we'll have a full report of that that should take him about what did he say about two weeks about two weeks to complete that um, so once once he completes that, then we'll have that inventory. Obviously, we've gone ahead and ordered some stop signs. We know there's a lot that are out. Um, we'll be ordering whatever other signs that we're going to need at that time based on that. Is it Are, are those things that, that we, we would have access to funding for, or we're going to have to find funding? Yes, sir. Well, we, we, have, we always have to front the, front the money up front for those types of things, but our hope would be that we would be reimbursed to those through the public assistance grant process. Yeah, I was asking um, about that Saturday at Veterans Breakfast. Uh, they said uh, Woodsy Park was a free for all. We drive and it have to stop signs, and the whole neighborhood was gone. Yeah, they're not. They're not gone. Probably, they're probably in somebody's garage. Um, <laughs> probably. Yeah, that, that, that's what tends to happen in these situations. But that that is, you know, that's a good lesson learned uh, for us uh, because we don't normally keep a whole lot of stock in those things at the shop. Um, so that's something that staff is looking into how we prepare for future events and things like that when we do have needs for stop signs, yield signs, uh, you know, all those types of things that we're going to need. But we do have an inventory going on right now. Right now we're working on building a lot of our data up, particularly that goes for our infrastructure. Um, that's something that, um, that uh, Mr. Lockme has initiated with this contract. Not only is this contract going to do just the storm issues, but it's also going to have a sidewalk inventory. It's also going to have a street, um, some other, other just general signage inventory um, that we have there. So we're working on building our data. Because frankly, right now we don't have a lot of that uh, that, that information there available. And I was supposed to give a message. Mr. Sue said the Sue Circle sign was by the swing in his yard. <clears throat> that we could pick it up at any time. <laughs> some sort of a directional sign to indicate that there is a turn into the uh, retail area before you get to the main uh, roadway that everybody uses to get into the retail area. When you're coming from um, uh, Low Country and then on to Brunswick uh, Forest Parkway to go to the medical center, if you don't know where that turn is, you can go right past it. Uh, it's it's a tricky turn I think, for new newbies. One thing I, if I might, Neil, I think you need folks need to understand that your reimbursement from FEMA may not be 100% of the cost. That's right. uh, Absolutely. Uh, you know, I think I think I heard like 85% or 80% something like that. So, you know, FEMA is not the percent answer but it's, it, it, it eases the pain yeah and that's that's the reason and, and this is part of the reason why we like to keep a, a healthy fund balance in the town um, you know these are these are the exact issues where you did. I was reading something about Pender County last week um, their fund balance is nine hundred thousand dollars at the current moment based on all the expenses that they have um, you know with now they're going to get reimbursed for a lot of that but right now they, they were looking at some of these the debris pickup issues on you know, unpaved roads and things, and you get to the point where, hey, you know, you have to make some tough decisions on what you can and cannot do. As far as our costs thus far, we anticipate our debris is going to be just just around a million dollars, um, and that's a lot of money. And, and hopefully, we'll be reimbursed mostly for that. But we'll go through the process to do those do those things. Maybe anything too, uh, Simon Brock about Frederick Forest. 
I've noticed myself the, the arrows, the painting of the arrows and stuff like that in the road are pretty well really faded. And just the other day, your car was going the wrong way. You came out, and instead of being on the left lane, you come back to 17, they were the first lane. So, but the, light, the light, uh, lanes were very, uh, you know, worn out. I had to bet at the mall the other day. <laughs> That's the one I saw that car. I, the <laughs> I, I have one more question for two. Uh, on the Waterford repaving, I know what I've done, but I just want to, for my own information, there are certain spots that look like they haven't been touched at all. So well, I just. We'll bring that up in own new business. Oh, okay. We're going to talk about infrastructure. So. Yeah, well, this was mostly for the, from the hairpin stuff. Okay. The, the last time I had a question about was post flooding issues, where, where we stand with uh, studies and evaluations and assessments and that kind of thing. And sure, so I had to take that a little bit. At the last, um, the last meeting, council instructed staff to send a letter. Um, and so we sent a letter to the gentleman who's the head of the North Carolina Flood Quality Management. Um, asking him for uh, to study this area in particular. We've not heard a, a response from him, formal or informal. Uh, we'll follow up with him with a phone call this week and see um, how they're how they're planning to handle our, our request. Um, so that that really is where we are on that. We've we've produced some maps. I've asked uh, uh, our planning staff has prepared a couple maps that we're that they're just kind of working on, looking at the 500-year floodplain, uh, looking at different elevations. Um, for this uh, for this storm event, I believe it was 16 and a half foot elevation was what we were looking at. Um, some historical data on that, but really we're just kind of digging into that right now. Um, yeah, if you can if you can locate other hurricane impacts, Floyd, whatever, yeah. that gives us an idea of what what happened with the water here. In the that's right, and that's what we've asked the state floodplain management to, to do, and we'll, we'll continue to pursue that. I would I would just uh, Ask uh, the rest of the, my colleagues on the council if we would be in agreement that we get a, a regular update on all these issues on a monthly basis until we get these things resolved. If the staff would, uh, the staff would give us an update very similar to what Neil's just done. Okay. Thank you. So that's it. So the board will go ahead and. Um, provide that for you on the monthly basis. Okay. Thank you. Strategic planning for housing. I brought this. I brought this issue up. I had uh, had the opportunity to attend the North Carolina Coalition Housing Coalition uh, annual conference up in Raleigh a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I know we've been back and forth on uh, on housing issues. I think the thing that I would like to uh, propose that uh, we consider uh, during the budget process is establishing a housing services service. Uh, we have uh, I talked with Chief uh, Grimes a little bit before the meeting, uh, estimating the uh, the number of uh, seniors we have that are over 55, and in the next uh, 12 years, which is what I think our planning takes into consideration, we're going to have an, an even older population. We have lots of folks that um, currently live in uh, depressed parts of, of, of Leland with, uh, with trailers or housing that may need uh, upgrades, help with uh, upgrades in bathrooms, kitchens, uh, ramps, uh, coverings for trailers and things like that to help protect the roofs. Um, developmentally disabled folks who maybe live with a family member that over the next few years uh, they may or may not have somebody else to, to take care of. People don't have a place to come uh, to ask for housing services or at least it's not identified as housing services. So, um, I'd like to ask for consideration that uh, that's something that we look at during the budget process. Okay, uh, Mike, on that, um, uh, my presentation I'm doing with staff um, to the HOAs that we're having, that's one of the questions. And uh, <clears throat> the staff is going to compile all these and bring them to us at our budget meeting to see how people feel about certain things. So those kind of services? All, all done. I think we've got 17 questions or something like that that we've asked uh, to see if, if they're really, if they think it's a need, if they, are they willing to, for us to increase taxes to do some of the things that uh, has been requested. Okay. There are opportunities, I've mentioned this before, for the town to partner with the uh, housing finance agency at the state level 
and Habitat for Humanity and other organizations to where we could receive matching funds if we were to do something like that. I've not seen a copy of that, so if the staff can give me a, a copy of those questions that have been asked to HOA. Sure. Okay. 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 Has your HOA had groups yet? Uh, Ashwood has. I was not available for it. Okay. I think we had a meeting at the same time, or I was either out of town or on the other. Okay. All right. Flood and, no, recognition of Strategic Behavior Center's 10th anniversary. I just wanted to uh, ask, I was asked on your behalf to attend their, uh, their anniversary uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and it is such a phenomenal story that I think it's something that, uh, that, that would uh, be beneficial to highlight uh, with some form of recognition for them. This is a company that started here in the Leland area. They are physically located uh, in uh, what I hope we call the Innovation Center soon, but in the old industri the industrial area. Uh, but this is a company that provides services to folks here in Leland and throughout the county, and in some cases throughout the region. Uh, it's a behavioral center. Uh, it's a 120-bed hospital. Um, I'm, I'm sure some of you know about this. Some of you may not know. We have a 120-bed hospital here in the area um, that provides services to folks that are typically uh, have behavioral issues that are under the age of 18 and also for folks that are uh, uh, elderly, that have issues with uh, related to dementia and behavioral problems. This company has gone from its first facility that was here 10 years ago to 13 facilities in eight different states. Uh, they're currently uh, headquartered in, in Tennessee, but uh, they have a lot, of, a lot of senior headquarters type staff that are here. Uh, and it's a pretty amazing story of how they've been able to provide these services. So I'd just love to see us um, uh, recognize them for their success. Okay. Who wants to prepare a Yeah. Just prepare one for me to sign and give it to them. Do that for Thursday night. Um, I know y'all are overworked like crazy. It, it, it depends on if y'all can get the time to do it. Okay. I just hate to keep putting more work and more work on you guys whenever y'all um, y'all are still in recovery from the hair. Can you let Jacob know? Okay. All right, flood and study. I think Neil we'll covered, touch base on that covered already. some of that, uh, where we are with that. And um, the stormwater compliance. I, I know there was some letters that were sent that yeah. you signed on that. Have we heard anything back yet? No. Yeah, you're, you're oh. cor yeah, you're correct. We yeah, we have heard anything back. Okay. Again, if you could just give us an update on a regular basis about whether you're getting response from them or not. Well, the response should come to me, and when it does, I'll make sure everybody gets okay. a copy. Thank you. Update on Cheesecake Fair benefits. Uh, I ask that this be added. We we committed twenty thousand dollars, I believe, to this program over two years, and uh, I have a heard or seen an update on that in a while. I was just wondering if we could get uh, a little bit of feedback on that for that stand. I can reach out to Natalie. Um, to my knowledge, they have not sent out any updates for, uh, for months. So frankly, I'm not sure we can track anything at this point, but I'll certainly reach out to her and report. If you would, if you could give us, you know, come back to us with uh, what we anticipate those benefits either have been or can be for the town, that would be helpful. What I may even ask you to do is come back and speak to you all. Uh, if you recall, you spoke several months ago to the council. Right. Let me ask her to come back and give us a Right. Thank you. Uh, town facilities, Parks and Rec, Parks and Recreation Building, Magnolia House. Um, so during Hurricane Florence, uh, both of these structures sustained some roof damage, which subsequently led to some water damage inside of both structures. Um, we've initially gotten some information back from the Magnolia House from our insurance adjuster, and we're still waiting for some information on the recreation building as to what the cost for repair and such would be. Um, as of right now, we're looking at roughly $21,000 of repairs that would be needed to the 
uh, Magnolia House. So considering that that structure is not slated to be there as part of the park master plan for the municipal campus, uh, staff is looking for some direction from council as to whether you think it's appropriate for us to move forward with repairs or if you think that Again, considering the park master plan doesn't have that facility there long term, that's the best use of our money to make the repair to that building. Wow. How many years are we out from having the park plan executed? Hmm? So, so what? Uh, update council on the friends of Robert Group. Yeah. Where they, where they Correct. So we do want to be aware that there's a tenant in there currently. So the friends of the library currently use the building. Um, they hold a monthly book sale. Um, as, of, as of now, they've taken all the books out. They're using a satellite office for the time being. Um, they would like to stay there long term. Their contract has them where they pay a $1 lease per year to us. For use of the building. Um, again, their their intent would be if they could to continue to use the facility. Um, I, in my conversations with Jenny, as the president of the Friends, she knows that the park master plan doesn't have the park it doesn't have them there as a long term uh, plan. So they're aware of that, and they're working to make arrangements to move towards that long term. Um, we went back and looked at the contract and section six of the agreement gives either party the right to terminate the lease in the event of damage that results in it being unusable. Um, so if council chooses to do so, we are within our contractual obligation and rights there to exit uh, the agreement there if we, if we decided to. The words that came to me from one of the members there uh, was that she says in my background and what I see she said it would not be a good business decision for the town council to redo that building and let them move back in. I that agree. came from one of them. I agree as well. Let's see spending money on if they're already in a temporary place are they looking for a permanent location? Well they they they're, they, right. they lost Three fourths, I think she said, of their inventory. Mm -hmm. And that's already been removed. Uh huh. Right. They, they still have their shelving and other items in there, but all the books and everything have been taken out. Um, the roof damage led to water damage in two separate rooms, some mold sport. Um, there was some water damage in the hallway that ran down and caused some uh, damage there in the hallway as well and into a closet. So um, it's not a ton of work, but it's a significant amount uh, that, that's needed to make those repairs. And, you know, it, it is, I have a question. Is the town liable for any damage that was caused as a result of them being in a lease status in our facility? So our insurance can would account for that. Um, have they filed a claim? They have not. Most no. of the books that they get are as donation, um, so there's not a, a, a good way to assess the value of all the books that, that were damaged. Mm -hmm. um, but they have, they have not done that and they have not expressed that they, they tend to. Mike, normally uh, renters have to get a separate insurance policy. Correct. Do they have and that? I'm not, uh, offhand, I'm not aware. Yeah, Because our insurance will not pay for any other stuff. That's what I wanted to do. I, w I would agree with uh, with Bob and anybody else that uh, looked at this and said, "No, we should uh, we should go ahead and give them notice. Uh, we're going to go ahead and proceed uh, at some point here to demolish the building to be in compliance or follow our master plan." You yeah. said you were looking for guidance. I think didn't you? correct. So what we would look is if if you guys are in consensus that we would not make the repairs of the building, then staff would make the tenant aware and then from there we would look at how best to go about moving forward with demolition of the, uh, the property. So we're going to look at demolition as soon as it's possible, not two, five years from now. Correct. I, I, 
would think that would be the most appropriate thing to do. Yeah. Do you see a, a, an issue with, you said they had shelving and that kind of stuff in there. Is there an issue with leaving that there on a temporary basis until we decide we're going to tear it down or they have a place to go with it? Uh, what's your feeling? It's something I can discuss with the uh, president of the Friends Group and, and see what they intend to do long term. Um, she had expressed that they have reached out to a couple of the organizations that are looking for a permanent place to move towards. Um, but they don't have anything per se at, at the moment. They are working at a satellite uh, facility. They, they were able to take the books out. They just didn't have time to get all this, the shelving structure. So, she thinks that they can get the shelving out, then they could be totally out of the facility. Um, or if we needed to hold for a period of time, that's a possibility for us as well. Is, is the shelving such that, that it could sit there without a big problem? I mean, if it's a metal shelving or something like that, it probably would be decontaminated. So there are some some metal shelves, there are the other structures of wood that are in there. Um, I would make the recommendation to them to take everything out. We do have a mold that has yeah. spored afterwards and that's been uh, worked to help slow down the growth and stuff like that, but we have we really don't have any way to keep it from moving in front. Yeah, as long as it's open it's still wet, it doesn't matter. It's gonna come back. Okay. So that's a consensus on that building. How about the Parks and Rec building? With, with the Parks and Rec building, kind of the same situation. Uh, some roof damage, which, which led to water damage inside. Um, the upstairs portion of the building has a loft, and that loft, the insulation in there and things of that nature got wet as well. Um, the HVAC excuse me, the, the heating unit that's upstairs also got some water into it. Um, some mold spore on the inside of the building, on the roof, and then we had some tables and chairs that were in there. The chairs actually had uh, cloth cushions on the bottom that got damaged as well on the water. Um, again, we're waiting for the, the insurance adjuster to give us what the quote would be for repairs to that, but we would like to see some direction from the council if you want to move forward with the same recommendation for that building that we would for the uh, Magnolia House uh, should the dollar figure come in and we see a, another large ticket to make repairs to that building. Uh, some things to be aware of for that building as well, those restrooms there that do support the park during events and such. We have ported vets right now that are supplementing uh, the PD unit is in there as well, with some of their functions, as well as the streets and utilities, their skating unit is in that building as well. So those are just some things to be aware of, functionality-wise, that, that the building is used for, besides regular rentals and events and things like that, which we may notice all those folks that had intent to rent or use, we told them it's not available at the moment until we have a long-term decision on repair or... Uh, I think that's something we have to wait and see what the insurance is going to cover us again. Mm -hmm. Skate is pretty critical, right? I, I hate to lose another facility that we count in a lot of things. But there's no sense in pouring a whole lot of money into something that uh, may not be worth it. Yeah, I money. agree, but if we're not going to build, if we're not going to execute this park plan for several years. Well, I, yeah. I would be concerned about the, the SCADA data system, and, and that's critical to our, our uh, infrastructure. That's something that we need to find a permanent home for that it makes it secure and, and uh, well cared for. We would have to relocate that. Mm -hmm. Your intention is to, to demolish that building with. Right. And, and I, think, I think that's something we ought to, we ought to consider. Uh, you know, that, that has a certain value to it physically, and then it, it provides security for the, the water system. Yeah. That, I think long term there was an intent to move. Uh, I think we were within a window of time where we're moving to a different 
way of cataloging that information, yeah. is that correct? Yes. Um, <coughs> next month, for you, we should have a contract for you for um, moving off of the current uh, RF radio frequency um, SCADA system, going to a cellular-based system. Um, so we'll have some more discussions with the, um, the contractor about that as to what that means with our current SCADA setup. Um, is that a cloud system? Or we go to a cloud system? For practical purposes, yes, it, it is a cellular-based um, system with cellular receivers at the individual um, lift stations. It does not require the radio frequency. Now, there are some things that you that you may want some redundancy in that system. Um, those are all things we'll have to look at um, as far as that. But we, we do anticipate that coming to you guys next month um, for approval of that. So I think at the next month we'll have some more information on the SCADA. Does that include in that upgrade or that change uh, consideration of moving to a more secure facility or a more environmentally uh, sensitive area so they can? Uh, I mean, uh, that may not be necessary whatsoever. I mean, we, we may not need that tower. We may not need that. That. So you could do that function outside of that building. Is what you're saying? Yeah. You don't need the building. The, the long-term vision with where the rec building stands is for there to be a splash pad and a restroom building uh, associated and, and shelter associated next to that, where that platform, <coughs> that building is long-term. So um, the, losing the restrooms would hurt in the interim, but there's a long-term goal to replace with a uh, restroom building. Um, if we look at the pros plan that we just recently adopted, it speaks to a lot of this. This was one of their recommendations was to move forward with the municipal campus master plan as, as, it, were, as it was presented in October. Um, so McGill and associates put together that, that plan of uh, municipal campus and, um, and some, then gave some costs associated with it. Um, they, they recommend doing it in phases. The rec building was initially uh, slated to be done in phase one and the Magnolia house was in, in slated to be done in phase two but those are a little bit fluid they are quite close to one another those items could be adjusted based on the current demand or current need that we see does that include the parking lot too it does in phase one it does okay. Okay. something something to be aware of um, again we haven't received the initial Cost from the insurance adjust for that structure, but once we do, we can bring that to you guys and make you aware uh, of what the cost for repair would be. Okay, thank you. Culture arts center sponsorships. Um, so town or town staff were contacted requesting a sponsorship and so I wanted to make you guys aware of what it was and then kind of segue that into long-term conversation. Um, so Ms. Juanita Harper with the countywide CDC uh, has made a request for an evening with the arts for the Cultural Arts Center. Uh, they estimate that their guest count for that event would be 185 people uh, and it's really intended to be a uh, they, they wish to bring the Brother County Big Band, Emma Davis, and the Carolina Sound together uh, with some other uh, young adults to do a performance for a black uh, historical music artists and to do something during uh, the month of February. Um, they're targeting January 26th is the date that they would like to host that. And they're outreach is to try to bring diverse communities together for culture, cultural enrichment. Um, they're asking for a sponsorship using several different rooms within the building, the multi-purpose room, the kitchen, the hall gallery, and the dressing rooms, and the classroom. Um, they would also be hosting a one-night rehearsal, <coughs> and they would be charging a $75 ticket for their, for their uh, participants. So essentially this is structured as a fundraiser for this organization. Their ticket sales will go to help support some of their programs that they host. Um, the total sponsorship that's estimated at this time is $3,395. Cool. So 
So looking at the sponsorship, um, the, the town kind of looked at what the criteria was for what this, what town sponsorship's policy currently states. It says that the event shall have a direct financial benefit to the town. Uh, the event shall benefit the town's programs, efforts, and initiatives. So considering those items, uh, I don't think that this event does either of those for the town of Leland. That's a lot of money when you're making money. Mm -hmm. yeah. Considering if they do sell all 185 seat tickets, $75 a ticket, they're looking at like $13,000 that they would make. And again, the money that they would make would help to support some of their programs. It doesn't help support the programs of the Cultural Arts Center. So it's not like Typically, when these come in, we see a copy of those. I don't think we were provided with that. Correct. So today, I wanted to have more open discussion about it. And if you guys decide that it is a direction that you would like to move, I would, um, we would have it put on the consent agenda for Thursday night. Um, but considering last month, you know, we, we brought forward several, and I think this is a good segue into the long term here. Um, we brought forward several sponsorships to you guys last month, and we started looking at the dollar figures for those. And there was a large ticket item that was associated with that that we were considering giving away a sponsorship. And considering we want to try to get the Cultural Arts Center to a point where it continues to have better and better cost recovery year after year, I think it might be smart for, for staff to revise the policies associated with the Cultural Arts Center and sponsorships. Um, as I looked at this item, this more and more looks like a fundraiser. And while we do have criteria in here that speaks to approval or denial of this, it doesn't address fundraisers. And if it's town council's recommendation, we can go back and revise our art centers, or the, the sponsorship policy to reflect what types of things we should be bringing to you guys uh, for approval. Um, Certainly, we, we want to support different organizations. The high school, I agree with you guys, was something that we should look to support. Uh, but outside organizations that have their own funding mechanisms and can stand on their own two feet uh, should probably be looked at in a different criteria. So staff would like a recommendation if you guys are in support to go back and revise the Cultural Arts Center's policy to try to establish a better criteria for what sponsorships would look like. I think it makes your job easier at the end of the day and these things just aren't coming in over and over and over again for you guys to have to or to not. Okay. Yeah, that's a good idea. All right. So we'll move forward with trying to update the Cultural Arts Center policy. Um, in the meantime, the sponsorship that I discussed with you guys today, is that something that you guys want to move forward with or look to deny? The staff would make the recommendation to deny the sponsorship. I'm not in favor at this point. I'm not in favor of this unless uh, it's something like we get 50 percent or the center gets 50 percent. Mm -hmm. I mean, either or, we have to fight either no completely or 50 percent of the proceeds. Why don't we let them make those recommendations and <laughs> update, but at this point, uh, deny it based on the impact? Yeah, I, I'm not willing to just cut and dry mm -hmm. like that. No. So staff, for this, staff would need a motion uh, to deny this sponsorship based on the current application. Okay, somebody will make motion. Uh, say the name of the organization again. Uh, the countywide CDC. Okay. I move that we deny the countywide CDC application for town sponsorship for this event. Second. All in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Motion carried. All right. Before we continue, we're going to take a 30 minute break for lunch.
makes you a lot of Yeah, I forgot it. Yeah, it's the same from the back of my cup. Okay, so for Thursday night, uh, one of the first things we'll do is recognize John Russell, uh, an outgoing town attorney. We have a plaque that we'll present to him. It's actually a plaque with a plaque on it. <clears throat> so it's something pretty nice to give to him. Uh, and then, Mayor, you had talked about. You might want to take a recess at that point. Yes. Um, you want so, to have so, some refreshments and. You know, I really think we should. Okay. Um, I know uh, Mayor Thomas said he was he was coming, and I've invited a couple of others too. And I just think it'd be nice for everybody to be able to tell him bye in private, not out up in public or whatever. Not not a long long recess, just a few minutes, just for us to say something to him, and then we'll go back in and get started. But it, you know, might even want to take one of make it private, one of the uh, conference rooms or something. I don't know, whatever y'all think. We just do it here in the in the lobby upstairs uh, because we do need him to come back in. He's going to be in the closed session. Oh, okay, okay. So we're not going to let him go. Oh, <laughs> I thought we were going to kick him out. <laughs> okay. So we'll find out a little recess and uh, a little bit of reception. Yeah, I think I think we should do a little something for him. I mean, he's got twenty plus years, and uh, that's a long time. Everybody okay with that? All right, so then after that, uh, we have a couple of presentations. Uh, the first is the Lions Club. <coughs> Were they both given a, um, a time limit? So um, I'm going to verify that uh, this week, so I'm going to share that. <coughs> okay, so. <coughs> Just a few months ago, they gave a presentation about Lions Club. And he wants to give it up about the membership uh, that they had kept gotten since then and the things that they did to help people. So kind of an update. update. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> and then the next one is Cape Fear Resource Conservation and Development. Uh, Ms. Dark Angelo is coming to make a presentation about that organization and what they do. Mm -hmm. I had uh, gone to their annual meeting uh, down in South Florida at John Ravens, yeah. And they uh, have some partnering opportunities for the TVA. They're going to come talk to the TVA as well. Okay. Uh, but they, she had let me know that they have some initiatives underway <coughs> for some flooding studies that include drone work and partnering with the University of North Carolina. So I want her at least to share a little bit of that. All right, so next is public comment. We don't know of anyone in particular <coughs> may be coming to public comment. I don't know if council knows of anyone. But we'll have that time available for the public to speak. Then we move into the consent agenda. We'll go to those items. So we have a series of minutes. I don't know if there's uh, any questions or amendments. Council? I didn't have any. I hope if there's anything, just uh, try and stop me. Time's up, time's up. Two, <laughs> three minutes. <laughs> so, well, if there's anything, please let me know. I'll make the amendments. Thank you. I don't know. April 2 is uh, authorizing town manager of his designee to execute an MOU with uh, the 596 transportation brigade there in Southern Port. They're trying to establish a protocol for all local law enforcement to respond in uh, 
investigate sexual assaults uh, occurred service members or their families. And uh, Brunswick County is getting ready to start a new uh, sexual assault uh, response team. And this all ties in with that. Any questions about that? The next item you have there is an uh, amended memorandum of understanding with Lenore Community College. Um, the one that we presented previously, um, their council had not had a chance to look at it because it, the stuff we sent was standard and their attorney kicked it back and wanted some changes. So some uh, changes were made under um, regarding the students. Questions? I thought I had seen that before. <laughs> Item 8.4 is three uh, change orders to SEPI for various projects throughout the town. Um, resolution R18471 is a change order one to task order six for SEPI engineering for professional services to relocate the station number 14 in the amount of $20,000, $20,200. The original design of the lift station was on the west side of the road and we looked at when some property became available on the east side of the road in order to get the uh, lift station out of the future park, we looked at moving it across the street and this is the change in uh, surveying and engineering that'll go along with that request. Any questions on that? <clears throat> okay. Uh, resolution 18-472 is for change order number two for task order number nine with SEPI to provide additional services for the inspection and contract administration of the North Gate uh, realignment project. Um, the original contract with SEPI Engineering was for 24 weeks of uh, uh, construction services at 25, approximately 25 hours a week. Um, as a result of some um, deficiencies in the original design plan and some items that have come up during the construction, they have uh, went over that time. So this change order is to get them to the design for what they have done and what they will do to the completion of the project. And it's in the amount of $89,000. So he likes us, don't they? <laughs> yes. Uh, so they, they made some design mistakes? No, ma'am. The original design engineer is uh, was a different design engineer and the design plans contain some mistakes that basically say SEPI has helped us. Do we, have, do we have any way of, yeah, any recourse with that? I'm going to let Neil talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. That. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that we we are doing right now currently, we're gathering up all our communications with the original designer, AECOM, um, and our uh, indications of, of what where the issues lie. Um, there were some problems with some survey, there were some sort of problems with some design, um, really just kind of a litany of things that, that we've identified. Obviously it's delayed the project, obviously it has caused CEPI to have additional um, role in that as well as you're seeing this change order, and it's caused issues with the contractor as well because it's delayed them uh, in, their, in their work. So, we are gathering those. We have uh, identified the, the point person at um, AECOM in the Raleigh office. We're planning to gather all those uh, communications together. Uh, Brian needs our town attorney. He's going to draft a letter that outlines all these issues. Um, we're going to provide that to, um, to their, their uh, head of their office in Raleigh and see, kind of start the ball rolling on what we can do to uh, ameliorate the process there. Has it also affected Harrington? Absolutely. Yeah, it, it certainly affected them, and and it could continue. It could continue, and it could expand. Um, you know, if at some point Harrington uh, would file suit, um, you know, against the town, um, that, that that could be something that we, there's a possibility. To say. 
because some of us, uh, as I came by today, I've seen them taking the curbing out and make fucking new curbing out. Is that all part of this? Or That's the majority of the problem. Yeah. So there's going to be some change orders from Wooten as well that come down the road as a result of this that we'll have to handle when, they, when we get them. Are all the storm drains going to be relocated? When no, sir. No. Um, I, I, one storm drain will have to be lower. The last iteration of the plan that I saw mm -hmm. hasn't been finalized yet, unfortunately, but uh, not moved, just lowered a little bit. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Right. Uh, resolution 18 473 mm -hmm. was for change in order number six for task government number. Task order number four was set the engineering for construction and administrative services for the old Fayetteville Road lift station number 10 improvement projects in the amount of uh, $51,497. Um, the original contract with CEPI was for 120 days. Um, during the bid, that time was extended to 160 days uh, with a bonus to the contractor for being done in within 120. Um, as of August, that 160-day period was complete, and so this change order, the, the job is not complete yet, and so this change order is to pay SEPI for the services in between that time. with the North Carolina Arts Council uh, for the Black on Black project. You guys will recall at last month's meeting, you guys approved the acceptance of the grant. This is just now allowing us to enter into the grant uh, and enter into an agreement with the Arts Council to actually host this, uh, this project. Subsequently, you also approved a budget amendment at last month's meeting for the 50% match of that grant. This is just the contract Moving forward from accepting from accepting the grant. <coughs> we have uh, one other item we'd like to add to the consent agenda. It is not before you today. Uh, Mr. Brian Eats just looked over the contract for us this, um, this past weekend. And uh, I reached out to the contractor uh, this morning and got a signature. Uh, but it would be for a contract with Cape Fear Pro Wash to do our Christmas light display, uh, install, uh, maintenance, and storage of all those items uh, in the amount of $22,558. This is the town purchasing the lights. Uh, this is them maintaining them for the life of the, the lights. Uh, they'll come set everything up, they'll take everything down and then they'll actually store them for a period of time. If the town requests the lights for another display for say Halloween or something else down the line, we have uh, X number of days to give them notice and then they'll give us the lights uh, and to move forward there. Um, so this contract would be for you guys uploaded to the consent agenda. This is a budgeted item, uh, so it's no budget amendment or anything like that required. <coughs> So the lights will remain town property. They will, yes, sir. Yep. Okay. I guess it's fiduciary. Okay. Correct. <clears throat> That's going to be so pretty. <laughs> okay. So, the consensus of council that we can add that item to the consent agenda? Yes. <clears throat> and then, first, I have to have a chance to look at it if there is a question about it. Yeah. Sounds good. Thank you. Uh -huh. <clears throat> Uh, so moving into economic community development, 8.6.1 is a resolution to approve condemnation of a property uh, for the purposes of a public utility easement for the Northgate Drive project. You may recall back in 2017, Council approved a long list of con condemnations for easements and right away uh, there was one uh, public utility easement that was overlooked uh, and has now been identified. 
uh, and this is that one last property that uh, must be acquired for a public utilities along the east side of the new road. Maybe that's why Mr. Ezra's trying to get up with all this. <laughs> yeah, whose who's property is that these one? Uh, Mr. Dale. Oh, huh. I don't think he's calling you about that. He's probably not aware of this yet. Any questions? Okay. 8.6.2 is approval of the amended version of the interlocal agreement with the county that you approved in October. Um, there's a couple amendments we made to that contract that was previously approved. Specifically, we added uh, a fee for commercial plan review, which they were doing for us. That was not in the previous contract. There was also another paragraph in that contract that referred to the fact that services were being provided by the county because the town was unable to meet state statutes, uh, and that was not an accurate statement, so we deleted that paragraph. Uh, any questions? Eight point seven one is resolution R eighteen four six eight. Um, this is a document given to us by FEMA to appoint a primary and secondary contact for dealing with all of the public assistance information back and forth with FEMA. Um, this document lists myself as the primary agent and Mr. Richardson as the secondary agent. We. I have been in contact with um, Ms. Mary Glasscock from the um, Emergency Management, North Carolina Emergency Management. She recommends that the primary and secondary match the grant portal, which is where we're providing all of our information. So this, these two individuals match who our primary and secondary contacts are in that portal. Any questions on that? Who is our primary? Primary. Yeah. 872 is another document provided to us by FEMA. Um, this is the agreement stating everything that the applicant, who is us, agrees to do in order to apply for public assistance. Um, and this is a requirement to engage with the public assistance application. Questions on that? Eight point seven three is budget amendment eighteen dash zero two four. This is um, a budget amendment for the um, item that Mr. Lockney just spoke about for the relocation of lift station 14. Are okay with those though? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that will be our consent agenda for Thursday night. I ask that you include that in one motion. Okay. <clears throat> Next item then is a closed session. We go into closed session with John Russell to discuss the uh, lawsuit uh, that we have with the Senator District of Minnesota. <clears throat> Next item is to get into some public hearings. So item 10 and a lot, item 11 are two separate public hearings pertaining to the Bishop's Ridge annexation and the development agreement. Uh, for that proposed annexation. Um, these public hearings were held in October. Uh, you'll recall there were a number of questions and concerns uh, presented by some of the surrounding neighbors as well as by Consul. Uh, the developer has requested additional time uh, to be able to address those questions adequately and put a study together and an engineering uh, background together before um, holding the next public hearing. And he does not feel he be, will be prepared to make that presentation until at least January. So he's asking that we defer this item to January. So rather than continue it to January, we're going to ask that you close the public hearing. Okay. And we will re-advertise it and reschedule it at the appropriate time. Okay. Any questions? 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 Okay. Any
and that would be true for both items 10 and 11. Item 12 is a contract with MVP Carolinas Inc. to calculate estimated costs pertaining to the conversion of the existing overhead electric power lines on Village Road to underground. You'll, rec you'll rec uh, recall a number of months ago, we had a contract with Duke Energy and we um, authorized them to prepare drawings and an estimated cost for their portion of the work related to that conversion that was submitted to us a number of months ago, but it did not include a significant portion of the work to actually install their cable that they provide, as well as concrete cutting and patching, boring work, etc. So we've spent uh, the last number of months trying to identify a consultant or a contractor that would be willing and appropriate to put together the estimated cost to the balance of the scope of the work involved with that uh, proposed project. We have identified MVP. Uh, they're the only consultant that service that was willing and able to do that. Um, and this is for a contract to provide that estimate to us. Once again, it's simply calculating the estimated cost for the balance of the scope that was not included in Duke's estimated cost. It does not include any drawings. It does not include any construction cost. It's simply uh, the, the projected cost of the work. We'll pair that together with Duke's proposal then to present an entire estimated cost for that work so that you can make a determination at that point in time whether you want to proceed further with that project. I wonder if the staff could provide us with just a very simple map that shows the boundaries that were coming up. Yeah, we'll have that um, in our PowerPoint presentation. Thank you. What is different with this that requires a public hearing? It's um, it's being presented for economic development purposes. Uh, we did the same with the Duke Energy contract. We feel that the burial of these lines is for economic development purposes primarily to attract businesses and to benefit the businesses along that business corridor. That's uh, per state statute, if it's for economic development, it's gotta be presented. Yeah, okay. thank you. 12.2, uh, excuse me, that, that was, 12.2 uh, is the budget amendment that Carly will present uh, associated with that contract. Uh, item 13.1 is an amendment to the zoning map uh, for a, recondi or a conditional rezoning of property along Village Road. Once again, this was a public hearing that was held in October. There were a number of questions and concerns expressed by council and by surrounding neighbors. Uh, staff and the developer are compiling information necessary to adequately address those questions and concerns. So we're going to ask that council continue the public hearing until de December 20th when we have uh, more information. There. Any questions about that one? 14.1 okay. uh, is a text amendment um, to amend section 14, chapter 42 of the uh, code of ordinances pertaining to exterior illumination of signs within residential districts. Uh, right now, ground mounted signs in all zoning districts other than residential are permitted. So in PUDs and in all of our commercial districts, a ground mounted sign may be illuminated externally if we'd like. Uh, but for whatever reason in our ordinance, uh, if they're not currently permitted, uh, a lighted sign is not currently permitted in residential districts. And these ground mounted signs would be uh, the identification signs of the subdivision as you enter a subdivision, such as the arbors or other similar subdivisions. Um, right now, the sign is permitted, but lighting of that sign is not permitted. So we feel that to be consistent with other zoning districts, it's reasonable to permit a developer uh, or HOA to light ground signs in residential districts. Does that include uh, internal illumination or it's all external? 
external. Yeah. And it's identified and described in the actual language of the text of that. And we'll talk about that in more detail about the actual public hearing. Okay. <clears throat> Any other questions? Okay. And then uh, 15.1 uh, is a text amendment pertaining to small cell wireless facilities and te telecommunication towers. Um, our current ordinance does not address either small cell wireless facilities or telecommunication towers. So this text amendment adds those to the ordinance. Um, there's been some recent legislation regarding small, small cell wireless facilities that has come out in the last couple of weeks that has yet to be addressed in our text amendment. So we're going to request that we continue this public hearing to December 20th to enable staff adequate time to introduce the appropriate language that came out of the FCC uh, ruling a few weeks ago into this text amendment so that we can have one single presentation rather than bring it to you two separate times. So once again, we're going to have to continue this public hearing uh, to December 20th. You think you have that information from the FCC? We have the information right now. Our uh, attorney um, under contract to assist us with this is just uh, reviewing that, and then he will help us introduce it in the text amendment in a way that's appropriate. And then the last public hearing for us um, is amendment to chapter 66, or 66 uh, pertaining to uh, accessory uses and temporary use uh, of uh, living facilities uh, pertaining to a catastrophic event. Essentially, this was uh, a text amendment coming out of the Hurricane Florence uh, storm where residents had a need to um, use RVs as temporary residents or temporary housing. Uh, our ordinance does not permit that currently. Uh, a number of other communities are doing the same. There's some model language that has come out uh, in response to this uh, hurricane uh, that other communities are also adopting in this language, is that same language. So it essentially will permit use of, our, of an RV on a residential site for a stipulated period of time um, in which a resident may live in until their house is uh, reconstructed. Um, was there any uh, information uh, regarding animals? I you know if your house is damaged or you lose your, your house and you may have some facility also on the property for animals, is there anything that covers temporary um, housing for animals? Well, I don't think the animals are addressed specifically, but you know, the animal could live in the RV just as the people are living in the RV, or they could be uh, facilitated on, on alternative on housing. That, you know, temporary facility that could be put onto the property. Somewhat like the mayor's husband sells like a, an article. That would be addressed as a stored building in our stored, stored building yeah. ordinance. So those are permitted uses located in a specific location on the site. But animals could be housed in that if needed? Or yeah, I don't think our ordinance stipulates that an animal cannot be housed there. Other does this, uh, I didn't see it here, but does this uh, give a defined or general period of time when these things can be used? Yeah, I think it, uh, it limits it to six months, which can be extended as much as one year. And again, it's a model after language that has been suggested to us by, um, by folks in Raleigh. Any other questions? Okay. Okay, so quite a few public hearings there and get through. Madam uh, Mayor just asked that you treat each one of those separately and open and close on the purpose. <coughs> Next item is discussion topics. We don't have any discussion topics at this time. Did the council had any that you wanted to add uh, to? The agenda. We all feel like to leave that there in case something does come up that you want to add the person might if you have a place to put it. Right? Something else that will arise. 
This is where I guess I can suggest another update on what's happening with the Waterford paving, which I know it's, it's not sorry, finished. And, Waterford paving. Right. But there are some areas that weren't even touched. So I'm just, you know, it's something that comes up quite often among the residents. See, it's not pretended. No, this is this is this is part of it. You want to add that? I, personally, I think it would be a good thing to do. For the consensus of council. Okay, no, it's fine. To add as a discussion. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Yeah. I mean, just just an update. It's yeah. simple. Okay. <clears throat> All right, if there's any others, uh, let us know, but uh, we'll have that space available for Thursday night. Then we get into old new business, uh, staff reports, board and committee reports, and opportunities for council, making reports that you may have. Um, then we have a closed session. Um, this will be with um, Brian Eads, and we have a few items to talk about there, different uh, so we're going to have two closed sessions. <laughs> um, so after that, uh, an adjournment. So a pretty, pretty large meeting to cover. Any questions about that? Anything that we're missing or uh, anything we need to add? December 1st, North Carolina Christmas Festival and Parade, 4 to 9, maybe. December, <laughs> sorry. December 11th, Breakfast with Santa, 9 a.m. registration. It's full already. Wow, good job. And February 2nd, Leland We Don't Know Tour. At the Cultural Arts Center, we got uh, November 15th, Artist Reception. Is that here? Uh, no, that's going to be at the center. That's at the center. No, I, I just read that. November 18th, Opera House 2019 preview, 3 to 5, December 1st, Holiday Art Market, 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. December 13th, Artist Reception. December 14th, the Moonlighters Orchestra Concert. January 10th, Artist Reception. And January 18th, Synergy Violins Concert. Madam Mayor. Yes, um, sir. We have a, a Leland we don't know that was delayed because of the hurricane. Uh -huh. So, Mr. Pat, I know you, you guys help out with that. Uh, if we could, we'd like to reschedule it. We're going to have to because we're getting calls, or I'm getting calls in at HOA meetings. Yeah. Um, Whatever works best for y'all's schedule. If, if we could do it in December, we'd love to do that and do it then. Um, but if not, we can always look at January. But we want to try to keep those two tours sure. somewhat spaced apart. It would need to be early December, I think, because a lot of people leave Christmas. Um, yeah, we'll get with you on that. Sure. How about that? That'd be fine. Thank you. Yeah. I do have one other item. Um, is it possible to get an update on the PDA board candidate application process kind of where they stand? Somebody. There are currently no applications that have been submitted. Um, but we went back out with a request to the okay. community for application. Right. Okay. And then, Do we have a time frame on that yeah. where we're going to kind of cut that off and make an internal decision about it? I'm sorry, the talking about how another call we had a 
No, I mean, I think a deadline on that. <clears throat> no, we didn't have a deadline on that. I believe that I believe that part of the thinking was that if we had gotten some in, it'd certainly be something you guys could consider at this month's meeting. But at this point, we, we haven't received any additional applications other than the ones that you currently had um, on file. Was there a firm decision on the previous applicant that was most closely aligned with, uh, with tourism as to whether or not we could pursue that if we didn't get any applications? I think, you, I think you certainly could. Um, yeah, if that was the applicant that you wanted to go with, I think you could afford that person as well. We did check that with the town attorney. And he, I mean, I think it came down to if it, it could work, you know. Okay. But I, I would like to keep nine people on if we could. It helps with making decisions. And, and also, not everybody shows up for meetings, too. Ready. I was going to mention that maybe in the committee's general meeting this week, you might want to add it as a discussion item. I don't know if other people in the committee know of people that might have interest to inform them. Uh, I can, we, can, we can discuss that, but again, that's a, that's a council issue if you're right. talking about just trying to get the word out sure yeah, yeah. but i do think that <clears throat> to your point though if you would like to go ahead and move forward with with uh, appointing someone to that position it is the purview of council so if that's something you'd like to pursue i can imagine right now you could ask to have that to the agenda for a person else yeah I, I would like to do that because we're going to be getting into our budget cycle and uh, i think it's important to have all positions filled is that an item you want to add to council for this month at <coughs> this point, or do you want to? If it's possible to add it, yes, I would. Add it. I thought you were going to talk to the TDA group first. <coughs> well, we will, but they, um, if we don't add it now, we'll, and I do talk to them. I'll be adding it. But you don't have a meeting until next week, right? No, no, it's this week. This week. Yeah. Oh, okay, that's it. Yeah, it's the next week. Okay. And we'll have a agenda meeting tomorrow. We can add it for Thursday night, if that's what you'd like us to do. Yeah, I'd like to make a decision on Thursday night because. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, we'll add it under. Um, as a discussion item, is that what you're doing? Yeah, we can provide those previous applications and, uh, and any additional that we get you know, in the communication that we had with the town attorney. And I think there was a question about communicating with Mr. Black as well about whether, how he would feel about that. Yeah, if you're going to make uh, a change as he's assigned the block slot. On the board, we will communicate with them. Okay. All right. Uh, what about the? Uh, I think the Thanksgiving lunch is Friday. Yeah. So there's uh, staff luncheon uh, this Friday. Potluck. Yeah. And we're gonna start at noon. Is that right? So we just want to have a, uh, a brief discussion about a couple items. Uh, 
We are in budget season a little early this year, and all the department heads are working on their department's budgets. Um, and as we go through, it came up a couple times. Um, we're kind of looking for some direction, a consensus, or a split motion if, if you plan to raise taxes. <laughs> It's it's a time consuming process. We just we're kind of looking for should we prepare for all these projects and show you how much they're gonna cost, or if you're a hard no, we're not raising taxes, then we kind of won't go down that road too far. Well, isn't it sort of driven by what we absolutely need to do? It is. Um, last year, it, I mean, it balanced with just an operating budget. So that's kind of why if, if you're not going to raise taxes, it's looking like we maybe won't work on any projects again for that year. Um, if you are, I, I, I'm not saying you have to say yes, we plan to, or no, we absolutely do not plan to. It's just kind of what you're thinking as of now. Let's get the question. Oh. I get sick of my tummy every time they say <laughs> But the reality is, we don't have enough money in our budget to do major projects. Uh, we talked about the parks and rec. Uh, master plan for the municipal park. Um, there's no way we can fit that into our budget if we don't raise taxes. Um, a lot of the other projects and things that we talked about, we just can't do unless we raise taxes. Uh, our survey to the HOA that we're doing is about what new service that council discusses during the budget process. Every year. Every year, we said, talk about the same thing. We're asking the public, are they willing to raise taxes for this service? And we're getting feedback. They'll present that too. But it's a lot of work for staff to work on projects throughout the entire year to get to the end and say, well, we're not going to raise taxes. And we really never were going to raise taxes throughout the whole year. So we, we spending a lot of energy and time working on that. Uh, if we can know up front, if you're even considering it, then we'll go through the process of doing that. If there's an absolute no, we're not going to do it, then it kind of helps staff know how to present the budget to But if we got specific <clears throat> needs, we will need we need to know. It's, it's premature to uh, I understand what you're saying, but I think it's premature to uh, look for a decision right now. Uh, we just had a major hurricane, which presented a lot of uh, a lot exactly, of things we need to consider. Exactly, but there are needs that you know that they know we need. When, when they know what they need, and, and I think they should present that to us the the, the special needs that we need that you need. Uh, but the rest of the stuff, I mean, like. Like I've said all along, we don't know. We probably won't know until next year this time about the, the recovery cost and things like that. The total. There's still a lot of unknowns. Yeah. yeah. So to say that we are or we aren't, I think, is premature. I think for guidance purposes, I'd be willing to say, well. Maybe a required minimal tax increase without going all out for a, a, the big ticket items. I would think that we, at, at this point in time, with what we've already gone through, we don't necessarily want to spend a lot of time on big, tic, big ticket items that are wishes instead of needs. Um, I think that just again for, for guidance purposes. Let's look at some of the, maybe some of the uh, needs that, uh, or maybe some of the wishes that are fairly minimal in cost that may not require a huge tax increase. Uh, look at them as we go along. 
That's my thought. Instead of waiting to the last minute. So in that in the survey, if we add up all the questions we asked and all the tax, post tax increase, it's about thirty five cent if you added all those things up. And those are just services. Those aren't projects. Those aren't uh, park projects or any other type of projects that, uh, that we could undertake. So in general, how we'll prepare the budget is what our minimal level of service we're providing right now, continue to provide that. Uh, and the few expansion areas where we see an absolute need. But it won't include big projects, big capital projects. No fire truck, yeah. And uh, <laughs> that's how we would, we would prepare the budget if you're telling us that you're not going to increase the budget for capital projects. But if you want us to go through that process of uh, looking at all the expenses of capital projects, we can do that. We've done that several years. And when we got to the point of saying we're going to fund any projects, we ended up saying no, we're not going to do it. So we're trying to kind of head that off a little bit. And I, I, I agree. I think, you know, being through that process a lot, and you go through and put all the stuff together, and then somebody that's sitting behind a podium or the, the data says, well, we know you did a lot of work there, but we're not going to give it to you. You're okay, so. I mean, and I understand what you're, I think what you're looking for is something that, that's going to be amenable to, without putting all the work and spending all the time, wasting your time, your staff time to, to put something together that's not going to fly anymore. If, if, if you could give us a range and say, well, we'll consider a tax increase up to maybe three or four cents. Uh, we're not going to consider 10 cents. And then we can build a range of what we can accomplish within that. Uh, amount of tax increase or no tax increase. You said, no, we're not going to do it. As a matter of fact, we want to lower taxes. See what you can do to be able to lower taxes by two cents or whatever. Some indication like that up front gives us a long period of time to work toward that. What we tended to do is get into May, June, and we're trying to make that decision in May and June, and the budget's got to be approved versus being able to talk about it well in advance. So that's why we're going to start the conversation there. <clears throat> Let's talk about the appetite for tax, taxation, versus, oh, here's the grandeur of things that we could do if we had all the money in the world. Well, I, I think we just have to look at this very realistically. Um, you know, just doing the things we need to do, I think, is going to involve an increase. And I'm, I'm thinking around three or four cents. And, I'm, and these are just the things we need to do. And it's mostly going to be infrastructure, which costs so much money, it's unbelievable. Can y'all excuse me? me? <laughs> I've been three years, and for three years you've acted like that. And, 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 you have, and you know what? You have to consider. We, I mean, look at how low our tax rate is compared to all these other towns. I mean, really. And we kind of had that discussion last, for this current budget year. And I think that I'm one of them that said, I don't want to see another tax increase, but for this upcoming year, I don't think we're going to do it year after year after year, but we've had a break this year. I, I agree with that. I think you know something in that three or four cent range. But, uh, I'd, I'd like to see us go as high as five cents. I, I could live with something within the, a range of about five cents. Brent is moving to Canada. No, you're, you're pushing for three or four, but I, I, I think you need to consider <laughs> five. Or, <laughs> uh, I know there's no stomach sure? for, for uh, us, but and I'm not pushing to, help the, to help the staff, I think at least five cents, I think, gives you a, a wider range to look at options. We can always, yeah, and I, I'm not pushing for three or four cents. I'm just trying to give them an idea. But yeah. If you go five, you can always cut back. Right, right, right. That's what I'm thinking. Well, 
for each so that they get 35 cents and come back. <laughs> but it just takes so much more effort work to do that. that I understand what they're trying to do. This. Well, you know, knowing what we've done over the last uh, three years with regard to the budget, and, and, um, I think the last one before we get to 21 was less than three cents. So, and I, knew, I was in favor of, like I said last year, I graduated. Over a period of time. Uh -oh. Your lights go off. Light one, come on. <laughs> <laughs> you like to recuse yourself? <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I'd be happy to see this work, work within five years. Bob, what do you got to say? You're pretty quiet now. No, I mean, I, I, You're sitting between the rock and hard yeah. spot. <laughs> 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 I know it's going three cents, five cents, no cents. No sense. <laughs> Don't take the heat in here. <laughs> but, uh, I'm serious. <laughs> we talk about men like recreation, just take park recreation, whatever. We talk about more uh, splash pads and these things. All these things. Everything's great. Everything's wonderful. Uh, but like I said, the main thing just come out of the, out of the hurricane, which is disastrous. Uh, if we can hold the taxes, like I said, with no, no increase in taxes, the people, the people will be very happy with that. But I think they'll realize. Yeah, there might be a little increase in taxes because we've got to fix things. Things have to be fixed. As, as a thing, is. We, we, can, we, we try, but you know things need to be fixed. No one's asking for anything really. No one's coming out really and say, "Listen, we want this and we want that and that." Really, to put pressure on us. But the main thing is coming out and say, "Listen, folks, here we do. We had a hurricane. This destroyed the town, as you know it was. And so, but we are up and running, and we are still the best town, and we're coming to be the better than be the better in the long run." But uh, sometimes we may need to get an increase. On, on serious note, I do know that we do need to start planning on some of our capital improvements. Sure, absolutely. Five cents. So typically, you know? typically what we're able to do in a budget, we do, we're a growing tank, and that's helped us over time. Uh, because our budget is continuing to grow as the town grows. And that's a good thing. So what we're able to do typically is keep the services that we have, add a few things, add a few people in different departments every year. And we've been able to grow a little bit like that. What we haven't done is brought on big projects, new projects. We've been able to fund most of those out of the money that we roll over from budget year to budget year. So we roll that money in, uh, to the general fund, and then we use that money through budget amendments to then fund particular projects. Much of the work we've done at Sturgeon Creek Park has been using those rollover funds, essentially. Set the engineer. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's typically what we've done. Um, the uh, we haven't incurred a whole lot of debt from the general fund side. We have incurred some debt from the utility fund side, the different projects, and we're working through our utility fund to be able to do that. Um, for, you know, pay the debt service on those projects. But um, we haven't taken on anything substantial uh, as a dedicated project because our budget just hasn't been able to do that. The money that we use to uh, this past year, in increasing the budget, we're added, we added more staff, particularly. Uh, and that was what we did there. We didn't really add anything tangible other than more staff. And that's kind of like getting a grant. You don't know that every year that money's going to be there. Exactly. But now you've uh, acquired new staff. That's going to be there unless you terminate it. Uh, <laughs> no, no intention of this. Uh, <laughs> I haven't heard a thing, but uh, but but using that money that you roll over each year, he doesn't that doesn't say that you're going to have it every year to do that. That's right. Uh, and and we've been able to bring on staff and stagger how we bring them on to fit within the budget each year. So we don't bring them all on July one. We might bring them on in October, we might bring them on in January. But we fit that into the budget for that particular budget year. The following budget year, then we've got the full effect of all those employees that we have to consider. So a lot of that, a lot of times, that eats up whatever gains we have in a growing town. Like Bob 
said, you know, no, I don't know anybody's asking for anything now, uh, but you never know when they're going to. And I'm kind of like, if, if we give them something, you know, they're not asking for anything, we give them something now, it may lessen that burden two years from now when they do start doing things. Well, I'd say the, the population's mostly retired population's coming back, we're not really sure. And like I said, they, they give a restaurant or something like that, and they're happy. And that's some people are very happy. A new restaurant will open up, a new store open up, things like that, they're happy. It would be wonderful to do a thing like the uh, Village Road, have the, the uh, overhead wiring taken down. That would be a great beautiful project. But maybe we can use a cosmetic project and maybe have a flower box on the Village Road and dress in that area up over there. Something like those, something small. They say, oh, look at look at Lila, what they got, what they've done, and stuff like that. People would appreciate it. That's not going to be as much, but to go up and big projects, I know, like I said, it's taking the wires down or the whole park program would be wonderful, but they're not asking for that, for uh, something like that. They're not anticipating the additional. They came here because for the reasons later. I, I, I think in reference to what you hear people asking for HOAs, you're only talking about a certain part of the population mm -hmm. that lives here. And they, we're not getting input from other parts of the population. Exactly. How many HOA meetings do we still have to go? About a dozen. At least six. Five or six, about half a dozen. I mean, there are parts of the town that, that do need things, and hopefully we'll hear from those folks when they come in about what they do need. We already know, after having done this for three years, where we, we still have a lot of needs. I mean, we've talked about trying to finish up our road infrastructure, that we still have roads that don't exist for some of our residents who've been paying taxes for years uh, about. Uh, so while I, you know, I understand the people that do come to the HOA meetings that typically represent folks or are part of folks in our planning and development, there's a considerable number of folks that are still living on the margins and um, need some basic things. I would say we're working internally on some strategic planning. Um, Ms. Rose and Ms. Brooks are working on that and working with the different departments to bring that together. And hopefully we'll have that to be able to present to you. But that the strategy associated with all those projects deals with how we can fund them, how we can finance them. Currently, that funding is not available in our current budget. When we have paving projects that the cost has skyrocketed, that's bad enough. But then you can't even get a contractor. I mean, to me, that's that's critical. And somehow, we got to have the money for these things. So is there a consensus there as far as a range that we should consider? I think five cents. Yeah, five. Or less. Okay. Is that everybody work within that range? No more than that. No, no more than that. Okay. That's, 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 that's four of us. Five or less. Okay. Let, let, me, let me say it doesn't necessarily change your list of projects or anything like that, that remains. It, it's the strategy for getting projects completed. It depends on what Mr. Hollis is asking you today. Those other projects will still be there. They'll still be on boards. You know, we've been working on the parks projects for years, and there's there's things that are going on, like Cypress Cove, we're working on the road design for that right now. Well, you know, the next step would be building that road, so that takes money. But point being said, it doesn't necessarily change your capital Projects, we just change our approach to those projects. So just keep that in mind as well. Okay. All right, next. <laughs> <laughs> that was sort of a consensus. <laughs> I'll work within that. Right? I'll take that as a consensus. <laughs> okay. Um, next, we'll have a closed session on personnel. Um, we will need a motion to go into closed session. Motion to go into closed session. Second. <coughs> All in favor of the motion? All right. All right. Motion carries.
Make a motion that we uh, approve the amended contract for the town manager pending uh, review of the town attorney. Second. All in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 Okay. Aye. Anything else? Uh, Mayor, I move that uh, based on uh, the town manager's performance that we give him a bonus of uh, $10,000. Second. Okay, all in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Do we have a motion to adjourn? I make a motion to be adjourned. Second. <laughs> all in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Motion carried. Next meeting date for the council agenda meet will be held on December 17, 2018 at 11 a.m. or shortly thereafter. Now, do me a favor, you know, think you had, I know it was so fast, I couldn't even copy it down. It's uh, all right here. I got that. Oh, this is what okay. you're saying? Yeah, that's what oh, I was saying. <laughs> <laughs> you sound like a normal person. You spoke so fast. I didn't know everybody had. Did get a copy or I just told you you have a list. Yeah. 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 One's at one five, nine. one's at six. Park Landing is at six tomorrow. Kick Grand National's at five. And then on Wednesday, Westport. So Pat, you'll probably be here for Westport. Yes. Yeah, so that's probably the one not to come to because both Brenda and Pat will be here. I'll try to come to Kick Grand National. Is it tomorrow night? Tomorrow at five? Yeah, tomorrow at five. We have it. Okay. CDA is Wednesday. Okay. Mm -hmm. So tonight we have Wedgwood at six. Right. Yeah, Missy will be doing the Cape Fear National. Okay. And she'll be That's doing the Park Landing. You said the 17th, right? The Saturday. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.